Okay, thank you so much for uh, to the organizer for this wonderful conference and the um, audience. I'm glad to see that it's still a fairly large audience. Um, so I'm going to talk about this work, which is I have to say uh, mostly was mostly done while I was uh, at D-Wave, and now is uh, uh, being completed at a, st a strict collaboration between uh, uh, NASA Quail and D-Wave. Uh, and so this is part of, um, of course, the sustained interest of NASA Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab to understand how quantum technologies can help in machine learning and artificial intelligence related uh, um, problems. So uh, maybe you are interested in, in this question, and I think if I pick up where uh, Cathy left. How can we use quantum annealers to to provide a quantum advantage, broadly defined, on some real application you are interested. And um, um, because the movie had few references over the years, I keep the tradition. Uh, if you haven't seen The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, I recommend it. Um, so The Good didn't receive much glory, at least until today at this conference, uh, but it's good to remind ourselves that quantum annealers are uh, remarkably competitive with state-of-the-art classical solvers on natively defined problems. And there is no reason, actually, um, we're very confident that uh, performance of quantum devices will uh, improve by order of magnitudes just because of technical improvements in the last few years, and I believe it's difficult to argue the same for uh, uh, non-classical solvers. Um, um, well, the bad or the doom was uh, nicely summarized by talks from Matthias uh, Troyer and Helmut Katzgreiber, also touched a bit upon by Daniel with a touch of hope. Uh, we have some problems here, of course. Uh, relatively small number of qubits, quasi two-dimensional, or if you want specially local connectivities, controlling thermal errors. Um, so um, it seems that uh, the embedding problem, for example, alone causes an exponential overhead when you try to solve op optimization problems. So how can we do that? Um, well, the ugly to me, it's what I'd like to focus is on. Um, we don't know how to use the good to be the bad. And like in the movie, it seems the bad is going to overcome, but eventually the good and the ugly collude to, to, to overcome it. So maybe that's where we are going. Um, but again, there are, if you want to, um, I would say use cases for quantum annealing, Optimization, of course, this is what, um, I guess, um, is what uh, quantum annealing was historically developed to do. It's a quantum heuristic for optimization. And here I would say most of research and most of the work is done in optimization. We know um, there are well-developed um, uh, techniques or, uh, for benchmarking and to understanding the performance of different solvers. And um, um, there are also many, many uh, subtleties, like Kathy was explaining. But still, we can use uh, established techniques like time to solution, uh, planting solutions. And uh, again, here, if you think about the practical problems, we have to use divide and conquer uh, uh, techniques which face lar large overheads. Um, we can also try to do sampling. And David talked about this uh, quite a bit uh, this morning. and. You know, this is a more, if you want, recent application for quantum annealing. And I would say that its potential is really not fully understood. At least we don't have clear dooming scenarios for it, right? Um, um, but it's also harder to work with sampling. The benchmarking is even more subtle. If you want to compute KL divergence, uh, it's difficult, of course, to, to compute. Um, and, um, for example, we know often for practical application, we, approximate is sampling, but how approximate uh, we should be, all these questions are not so uh, well understood. And if we can use quantum annealing for sampling application on real problem, then maybe we can take a more pragmatic approach and um, people can just use it and see whether it's better to 
uh, use a certain algorithm uh, or uh, just um, stick with uh, other non-classical techniques. So um, maybe you take off some of the workload on trying to benchmark and try to understand more theoretical questions. Just use uh, your uh, uh, algorithm and see how it works. Um, <clears throat> so you know, quantum maneuvers are of course, special purpose devices. Uh, our best shot is to use them uh, to use them at what they do natively as uh, simulators. And um, because there is, um, because they are uh, immersed in a thermal, but I would say what they do natively, at what they do best is uh, sampling. And um, this is basically uh, what David explained this morning. So I, I will go through this uh, quickly. But we, because of um, interaction with a thermal bath, at the beginning, uh, thermalization is fast. And if we use a technique uh, that ha have been uh, now developed, like poses and quenches, we can uh, more reliably um, sample from thermal distributions. And um, actually, the capability, this capability was nicely shown uh, in uh, the quantum material science paper by D-Wave. And we had Andrew and Richard talking about this. So we know that uh, we actually can use quantum materials as, uh, as uh, samplers. As um, the ha the in, in the paper there, we have some um, uh, connectivity adaptation, like we have some chains, uh, uh, small chains, so it works well. Um, our goal is really to sample natively without any embedding. Um, where do we want to focus in terms of application? Maybe uh, think about the most challenging machine learning tasks. That's where maybe we have the best shot at, you know, being closer to a quantum advantage. And can argue that generative modeling is um, one of the most challenging tasks in machine learning. Your model is trying to approximate a probability distribution, which is the data distribution, uh, which is unknown, uh, but I'm trying to approximate that. And it's typically done by employing uh, deep neural networks to start from some simple distribution and transform it into a complex distribution. Generative modeling is what is most really, what is closest to artificial creativity uh, and uh, maybe you heard about deep fakes, uh, but we try to do that for more um, better tasks, maybe. Um, can be used for feature extractions, too, so if you want to do classification. Um, also, quantum computation is intrinsically probabilistic. So the goal really here is to use quantum devices to sample from complex quantum computer distribution uh, for sampling for probabilistic tasks. Um, so one generative model that is well known is uh, Boltzmann machines, right? Uh, so Boltzmann machines seems a perfect match to quantum annealers. Um, these are undirected generative models that basically spin system. Um, and the goal is uh, that is to have a spin system with thermal distribution um, approximate your data distribution. And these models have are known. And Quantum annealers really are simulators of uh, Boltzmann machines. And typically what you do, you take your uh, sample, your data, you map it into a layer of visible variables, you use another layer of uh, latent units, and then the trick with this bipartite connectivity is that you can mar do this marginalization analytically. So you get this uh, model data, and this is what you want to adjust to reproduce data distribution. Um, um, you have to sample to solve this machine learning problem. Traditional techniques are like block skip sampling, uh, basically a flavor of um, uh, Markov chain spin updates, uh, usual thing. Uh, it's relatively efficient, but it's difficult to scale, and that's why state-of-the-art techniques don't really use Boltzmann machines. Uh, the goal here is to use quantum annealing to uh, scale to sample from large Boltzmann machine in, in a faster and a more reliable way. So this is what people use. Uh, it's a fully connected R RBM. Um, you want to simulate it, you may have D-Way to Tyson Q on a chimerograph. In the near future, you may work with a Pegasus connectivity. Um, so what happens if uh, the chimerograph is bipartite, so think of it as a fully con as a bipartite RBM with sparse connectivity. Say I 
try to train an RBM uh, on this connectivity, these are generated images. So, okay, this is your um, um, graphical representation of Doom, <laughs> if you want. Uh, but okay, maybe there are smarter and better things to do. And one thing is to, instead of try to feed data to directly to the hardware, you use some state-of-the-art um, techniques like deep neural net, in this case, for example, convolutional neural net, to do to encode your data set into some uh, latent layer of features, which is actually what you want to feed to the, to the hardware. So it's really a way to encode, using machine learning techniques, large-scale problems to your quantum device. And this was, uh, this idea is a very general, maybe sim also simple idea, and was also, I guess, introduced first by Benedetti et al. Um, our contribution was really to have a framework in which this um, implementation is scalable, is efficient, it is really state-of-the-art techniques that uh, people at, say, from Google to Facebook use uh, or similar techniques day by day. So really scalable state-of-the-art technique using variational encoders. Um, I think it's key here to, to, to point out that uh, uh, we are going to train the classical networks and the, the, the weights of the hardware jointly. So there is a feedback here between this huge classical machinery and the hardware. And so the hope is that because of this feedback, we teach uh, classical uh, networks to um, learn what are the best uh, features um, that improve, in a way, the performance of the encoder. So we learn uh, how to use in the most possible efficient way our available resources. Um, and also another, I think, very important point is that somehow if we think about in these terms, we don't need a hard-coded specification of the connectivity. So this is a very flexible and also easy to work with uh, kind of approach. So we implement these models. We use deep convolutional networks with several layers of convolutions. Um, for example, here I show an example in which we uh, train a 288-dimensional latent space with a camera structure RBM, and then we train our model end-to-end -end using only samples coming from a D-8 to Tassan Q, and these are samples generated using, uh, again, the hardware. So the idea is that you sample and then you decode using the convolutions, and you are able to actually have a model that it's correctly and well-trained on fairly large scale problem like MNIST. There are 50,000 uh, digits and uh, they are 784 dimensional. Um, again, as I said, we train the model. There are some derivatives here, gradients that requires the computation of expectation from the RBM, and we compute this expectation only sampling from a D-Way to Q. We use a simple uh, annealing technique, but we need to do some spin reversal. These are like technical details, but we are able to, to achieve these results that um, um, are usable, if you want. Think of it as a practical implementation. Now, um, a, a technical thing is that um, we don't know the, so, I can show you that, that looks nice, but we want to have a more maybe quantitative evaluation of what we are doing. The problem with that is that uh, if we treat the hardware as a black box, we don't have, uh, we don't know the probabilities of getting a given sample a priori, but we can assume, and that's actually a working assumption, that they are distributed according to a classical Boltzmann machine up to some uh, effective uh, beta temperature. So. We want to extract that, and we do extract that during a training, and we have a behavior like this, and um, we see some fluctuations. These are two runs that are also parallel in terms of wall clock. So these fluctuations are real uh, physical, real fluctuation of the physical temperature. Um, but so far we need to ex extract this to uh, um, have a efficient training. Um, but now, if we use this, uh, say, auxiliary RBM with this estimated beta, we can 
replace the hardware probabilities with the probabilities of the model RBM, and we can compute the likelihood of this model. And we see that uh, we achieve um, the, the model I showed you corresponds to likelihood that here that are uh, close to state of the art, which is now obtained by another work we have done uh, at, at, um, um, between NASA and D-Wave. Uh, but the main point here is that uh, I have two models which I train in parallel uh, with the hardware. In one model, in one case, I don't train uh, the weights of the hardware. In the other, I exploit the full connectivity, and that can show that that corresponds to an improvement of my likelihood. So, by using actually um, a non-trivial RBM uh, um, that is camera structure, I can improve the performance of the model. So, <coughs> um, okay, we have this setup. We can train some deep generative models. We can use them for practical application because we can scale them up. But okay, is there a, a, a path to quantum advantage in this setup? It's a highly non-trivial question. But somehow, uh, we, we can see a path if we can reliable sample from large RBMs, um, and the RBMs develop multimodal probability distributions. So, um, I'm gonna go through this quickly. Um, one thing that we can do is to, is to work with the classical encoders to, uh, more efficiently exploit uh, a given hardware connectivity. So, as I said before, uh, the, we have some convolutions and the last layer is a dense layer. But say that we now have our hierarchy. We set, we send a set of higher uh, features through a dense layer, sample, and then we use the, these values again as an input for another layer. So, we build a probability distribution that is actually has conditional relationship. So, we build correlations between two groups. And then we have an options. How do we map these two uh, uh, groups of variables into the connectivity, uh, two um, um, intuitive ways. One, we do it according to the bipartite structure of chimera graph, or one according to some, like, a, ch a chain structure uh, of the, like, these are vertical qubits and horizontal qubits. And so, a priori, we don't know which works better, but this embedding works better. And if you worked with these models, you may, um, um, Agree that this is a huge improvement in how we exploit the hardware. So this is um, how we translate in this framework the problem of mapping uh, your problem into the hardware. But again, you don't work in terms of building chains, and uh, uh, and you don't work with a hard-coded, low-level uh, um, um, specification of the connectivity. You work at a higher level and. Uh, if you want, which may be easier and maybe more efficient. But it works. Um, this is the number of units that are actually active. And this is another problem I want to briefly mention. Uh, um, in the way, in, in a variation of the course, we have two components of the loss function. One is on a, is a reconstruction term. And because it tries to reconstruct, uh, visible data from latent representation, it helps the model to use more latent units, more um, information encoded. But then we have a regularization which makes the encoder being equal to something that does not depend on the input. X the input, zeta is the latent variable. So this actually tries to shut off latent units. Um, this is good because it may allow for efficient compression, but uh, it turns out it's an optimization problem because during training we can be stuck in local minima with a suboptimal number of active units. But one thing that is nice to realize is that if we increase the density or the connectivity of our graph, we just improve the performance of the model and we exploit a larger number of latent units. Um, and again, we need a larger number of latent units because eventually we want to use larger BM. We want to make something from this larger BM complex. Um, so here I have Bernoulli means no connectivity, just independent discrete uh, Bernoulli variables. Uh, purple line is Chimera. Green is Pegasus. Red is fully connected RBM. And a nice thing to notice is that there is a fairly um, large amount of optimization for the Chimera graph, but, you know, you just plug in the Pegasus graph, it's more connected, it just works better. And, you know, you can just say, okay, start optimizing my model on Pegasus, you improve this performance. Uh, but again, this means we exploit larger RBMs. There is only so, so much you can do, and the reason is that um, 
simple data requires less code, less information, we can go to use lar more complex data set and we naturally use more and larger RBMs. And then, just second last slide, um, how about multimodality? Well, RBM can represent multimodal distribution, but will they um, during training? Well, if you have fairly connected uh, connectivities, you start seeing these RBM develop modes and even more for a fully connected RBMs. So you expect classically something from these RBMs uh, become exponentially hard for large RBMs. And so um, we also studied noise and we see that train is more stable with uh, low noise, uh, lower noise devices, which is the red one. And uh, to conclude, um, <coughs> I think there's good evidence that um, we can use quantum annealers as native samplers um, to train state-of-the-art uh, deep generative models. And we can see a path towards uh, achieving quantum advantage by exploiting larger and larger RBMs. Um, um, in the future, we need a more detailed study of how controllers affect training um, to improve sampling and effective temperatures with advanced annealed control. And of course, a scale up to more complex problem, do so supervised or semi-supervised learning, and also hybridize other generative models. And yeah, with that, let's go. Uh, yeah. So this means that uh, this one. So from the from the pure point of view, there must be a regime where Pegasus is larger than this. So yeah. So this means that it's a bypass. Okay. Well, it was not the best question ever, but <laughs> I still repeat it. So the question was that the RBM uh, that you compare it to seems to be uh, the best, no, for all cases. Fully connected. And, yeah. Yes, and I was wondering, there there must be like a, a takeover where Pegasus actually has a, a larger connectivity than this, and and it must turn then at some point. So no? Pegasus connectivity is going to be still quasi two dimensional, right? So yes. so you see, each unit here is connected to all units on the right. So this is, if you were to represent this geometrically, you would have some kind of non -log. But Pegasus is still more dense, but still local. An advantage of, an advantage of Pegasus is that um, it's not bipartite, um, while this is bipartite. So actually, the fact that it's bipartite makes something efficient. So as soon as you increase the number of partitions, classical sampling becomes less efficient. So, you know, uh, and uh, one thing of going to Pegasus is that, yeah, it's more dense connectivity, but then uh, classical sampling also is less efficient because nice. because you have to yes. you have to you cannot do it in two steps. Mm -hmm. You cannot parallelize in two steps. You have to do it in like the number of partitions of the graph. Nice. So mm -hmm. something from Pegasus is even less efficient classically than okay. camera. Yeah.